continuing with our sermon series, which we've entitled, We Are the Church. And today we are taking up our third session on that. Uh, if you remember, on our first week, we talked about the church, uh, that this was not the idea of people, but this was actually the idea of our Lord Jesus Christ himself. He said, I will build my church. And then the second week, we talk about our posture, the mindset that you and I ought to have when we come to church. Now, today's message is entitled, Marked by Love. Marked by Love because we need to understand and be reminded that as a church, the distinctive that we have is our love. Our love for God, our love for one another, our love for the world. So let's uh, all stand up if you're able to re um, Let's read the Word of God today. The text this afternoon is taken from Philippians chapter 1, verses 9 to 11. Philippians chapter 1, verses 9 to 11. So it's only three verses. So I want to invite everybody to read together with me. Verse 9. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent, and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we give thanks and praise to you. You are faithful. You are good. Lord, we glorify your name. Thank you for the recently concluded medical missions where your hand was so clear upon us. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to have been able to share the gospel and to be able to minister to people uh, around us. Thank you, Lord. And today, as we spend this moment to study your word once again, we pray that your Holy Spirit will be the one to open our eyes to the truths of your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please take your seats. Let me ask you a question. How many of you ever uh, have? You, how many of you have ever gone to church, and then, as you left the church, you were inspired to pray for somebody? Yeah. Well, there's this guy named Jaron Lowenstein who wrote a song about that, and it's a very interesting song. The song actually peaked at number thirteen in two thousand nine uh, in the Billboard Country Songs. It also hit number 34 in the top 100. In fact, it's his second top 40 song. And the title of the song was Pray For You or I Pray For You. And it actually narrates the thoughts of someone who just had a breakup with his girlfriend. So let's, let me just read to you some of the ly lyrics. It goes this way. It says, I haven't been to church since I don't remember when. Things were going great till they fell apart again. So I listened to the preacher as he told me what to do. He said, you can't go hating others who have done wrong to you. Sometimes we get angry, but we must not condemn. Let the good Lord do his job, and you just pray for them. So here's what he did. No? In the next uh, few lines, he would now pray for his ex-girlfriend. And the lyrics goes, now, I pray your brakes go out running down a hill. I pray a flower pot falls from a windowsill and knocks you in the head like I'd like to. I pray your birthday comes and nobody calls. I pray you're flying high when your engine stalls. Now, I pray all your dreams never come true. And just know wherever you are, honey, I pray for you. <laughs> Of course, I don't think that's what it means to pray for others, right? But, you know, seriously, when you pray for a brother or a sister, what do you pray for? You know, I think we can learn something from Paul here. If you, you know anything about the Apostle Paul, you would have noticed that in many of his letters, he would include a prayer. And when he wrote, for example, to the Ephesians, when he wrote to the Colossians, to the Philippians, uh, the church in Philippi, to the Thessalonians... He included a prayer for them. 
when he wrote to Timothy, when he wrote to Philemon, he also includes a prayer for them. And that's Paul. He prayed for the church, he prayed for the brethren, and he did it regularly. And in his letters, he would tell them what he was praying for. Now, there's one very interesting thing when you read uh, the prayers of Paul, is that he never actually prays for anything physical. Of, of course, I'm not saying that he never did, no. It's just that he never recorded or wrote about it. But what he did pray for were those that he saw were of much more important than just praying for general, you know, blessings or physical favor. And what he wrote were prayers that mattered most. And in his letter to the Philippians, which we just read a while ago, there's one part there where he prays for love. He prays for love for the church in the, uh, of the church in Philippi, as we read a while ago in verse 9, says, And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent, and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. So Paul is praying for a very specific thing for the Philippians. He's praying for love. Now, that's his prayer. And, you know, if you re read the rest of verses 9 and 10, everything, everything uh, reinforces that one main thought. He's praying that their love would abound more and more. Now, why would he do that? I believe Paul understands that love is the hallmark of faith and that it is also the hallmark of the faithful. In, the rest of, in, uh, in, his, in his other letters, for example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 13, this is what he says. So now faith, hope, and love abide these three, but the greatest of these is, is love. Now, our Lord Jesus Christ himself says, by, these, by this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Now, love is the most important expression of the Christian faith and of the Christians. It's, it's what marks us as a people. It's what marks us and authenticates and reveals the genuineness of our discipleship. You know, D.L. Moody once said that a man can be a good doctor without loving his patients. A man can be a good lawyer without loving his clients. A man can be a good geologist without loving rocks or science. But a man cannot be a good Christian without, without love. You know, today when we talk about love, we usually think with our 21st century mindset, you know, concepts of romantic love, right? We think about mushy love, love that's emotional, feel-good kind of love. And yet, we also think about love in the abstract. It's some grand and lofty idea where, where you know, you write poems about or where you write love songs about. And we don't necessarily think about love as an action, as a decision. We don't necessarily think of some of the love that we are supposed to be known for as believers of Jesus Christ. Uh, John Stott says, the first mark of a true and living church is love. So today, although it's not Valentine's Day, we're going to talk about love. Let's take a closer look at this prayer of Paul, because here we will see four marks of agape love. Now, that's the word he uses for the word love. So as we go through these four marks, it would be good for us to compare, to try to check our expressions of love as, and compare it to what Paul says that it ought to be. And I pray that the Holy Spirit will be the one to speak to us. He will cause us to grow, to display this love that ought to mark us as a people of God. Okay? So here's the first mark. The first mark of love according to Paul, is that love should be abounding. Love should be abounding. Verse 9, It is my prayer that your love may abound more and more. That word abound simply means to go beyond the expected measure. 
to go beyond, to overflow. Now, when it says that your love might abound more and more, in other words, it implies that they're already doing it. The Philippian church were already loving. It's not a rebuke. He's not saying you don't love at all. He's saying that let your love be even more. Let it continue to do so and do it even more. Now, how do you increase something that's already there? The picture I can think of is, you know, like a faucet that you turn on and you just walk away and let it overflow. Remember those times when, you know, when you open the faucet and, and you realize, you know, what they too big run? And you find out that, you know, maybe there's some repairs that's being made. And so you left the, the faucet on, forgetting that, you know, somebody is doing the repairs. And later on, when they turn it on back again, the water just, just flows, right? And then you forget and the re you realize that what happened. The wa water is now everywhere because you forgot to turn it off. And I think that's a picture of a love that overflows. A love that is abounding more and more. That's what Paul is praying for. Now the question is, what kind of love is he talking about here? Now I think of at least two. There's probably more, but I think at the very least, Paul is thinking of two kinds of love here. First, I believe Paul is talking about our love for the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Paul was one of the most passionate and devoted followers of Christ, right? We know that. His passion for Jesus had led him to sacrifice, to suffer a lot, so that he could faithfully follow our Lord. And, you know, he was even willing to die for Christ. In fact, he died as a martyr for our Lord Jesus Christ. In Philippians chapter 1, verse 21, a few verses later in this book, he says, For me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. And then you will find countless verses in the New Testament where Paul shows to us that his motive for serving, his motive for living, was because of his great love for Jesus Christ. And because of that, I believe it was only right for him to desire that same kind of love for the church, that that love for Christ will abound more and more. I think there's a second kind of love that Paul is talking about here, and I think it's based on the flow of thought. He's also referring to the demonstration of loving one another within the church. You see, when you read the book of Philippians, you will notice that there were some conflicts that's happening in the church. And Paul was trying to tell them, you need to grow in your love for each other. And so he tells them, I pray that your love for God and your love for one another would increase, would abound, would overflow. And why is that important? Why do we need to love one another? You see, in today's media-saturated world, it, it seems like it's easier to love people you never see than to love the people you always see every day. You know, when we read about tragedies, we, when we see you know, those on our media feeds, we, we don't mind actually sending help to them. We, we never know these guys, right? We, we don't know anything about them. When we hear about a calamity somewhere out there that happened in the world, you know, we cry out for them and we check our media feeds for updates. And now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that that's, you should be doing that. But here's something that I noticed and have observed. And when it comes to the family of God, when it comes to the brethren, love doesn't seem to come out that easily, doesn't it? it we're quick to show love for people we never see or know about. But when it comes to the brothers and sisters in Christ, we are not as sensitive. Now, why is that? Again, I'm not saying stop caring for others and the world. But, you know, for fellow believers, something has gone wrong. I think somewhere along the way, you and I have lost our priorities. And I have a feeling that there's, that's one of the reasons why people don't want to go to church. I, I don't want to go to church because, you know... The people in the church are very difficult to love. Now, here's what Paul says in Galatians. Notice what he says. Galatians 6.10. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, especially to those who are of the household of the faith. Notice his priority. Okay, Do good, especially to those in the household of the faith. 
1 Thessalonians 3, verse 12. Here's what he says. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all as we do for you. Very similar to his text here in Philippians, right? Notice the priority. May your love increase and abound for one another. That's the, that's the priority. It comes before everybody else. Paul is praying that this love for the brethren should abound and it would begin inside the church. You agree? You know, Tertullian, one of the church, one of church, uh, one of the known uh, church historians, uh, wrote about this. Um, when the early church began to grow very rapidly, the Roman Empire were a little bit scared. You know, they, they were thinking, you know, with these guys, with these people, uh, cause some problems uh, with the Roman government. And so what they did was they sent out spies to go into the local churches, went into the churches and to observe what they were doing. And here's what happened. One of the spies came back, and here's what Tertullian writes. It says, uh, the spies said, you know, these Christians are very strange people. They speak of one by the name of Jesus who is absent, but whom they seem to be expecting at any time. And my, how they love him. And my, how they love one another. So here is this spy from the Roman Empire, from the Roman government, who goes and infiltrates the Christian church. And he made note of the fact that they love one another so much, that they love Jesus Christ so much. And so that, that brings us to a very simple question of reflection. Things that we have to ask ourselves. Does our love for Jesus, does our love for one another, you know, abound? Does our love abound for Christ and those who belong to the body of Christ? I mean, think about it first. Because, you know, one of the things that scares me when, when I preach on a message on, for example, on love, it becomes something that's, you know, theoretical. Think about it. What does it look like, actually? How does your love abound for the Lord? How does your love abound? What does it look like for your love to abound for the brethren? You know, I remember reading from Kyle, one of Kyle Eidelman's book. I forgot the title, but there was this one time he was on, an, uh, on a trip and he needed some dry cleaning done with his with clothes. Now, he passed by a store with a huge sign which says, One Hour Dry Cleaners. So, you know, he, he immediately went back to that store and he brought his suit. And after filling out the forms, he told the clerk, You know, I need this. In an hour, you know, after all, one hour dry cleaners, right? And the clerk told him, I'm sorry, but I can't get this back to you until Thursday. He said, what? I thought you did dry cleaning for one hour. And the clerk told him, no, actually, that's just the name of the store. <laughs> you know what? Those of us who profess to be Christians but fail to act like the Christ whose name we bear, we're like that dry cleaning store, aren't we? We may carry the name, but we don't act like it. One of the distinctions of the church is love. One of the distinctions of the Christian is love. Because you know what? The love of God has already been poured out on us so now it should be poured out through us. So that's the first one. A love that is overflowing, a love that is abound. Here's the second one. The second characteristic of love. Paul says that our love should also be bounded. Look at verse 9. It's the second part. Here's what he says. It is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with Knowledge and all discernment. Knowledge and all discernment. Now, that's very important, actually, because Paul is now qualifying what this overflowing love is supposed to be. And he uses two parameters, knowledge and 
discernment because he's not naive, right? Paul is not throwing out, you know, let's just love one another. You know, love makes the world go around and all of that cliche thing about love. No, he qualifies it. And then an illustration that I can think of is that kind of overflowing love that is like a river with two banks. One bank is called knowledge. The other bank is called discernment. And there, the, the water flows. You see, overflowing water sounds great. But like a river, if that water is free to flow without any direction, without any purpose, it will end to be disastrous. Water is a blessing, but so much water that just flows wherever it wants can be harmful. You know, when I was uh, teaching in the university, we called that floodplain hydrology. And the water would just overflow and everybody else gets, you know, the destruction is harmful. And so too is love. If our love is just pure emotion, without direction, without discretion, it can become disastrous. It needs these two banks, the bank of discernment and the bank of knowledge. Let's quickly look at each of them. So Paul says, my prayer is that your love may abound more and more with knowledge. Now, what does that word knowledge mean? The word in the Greek is the word epignosis. It means knowledge that lays claim to personal involvement. So it's a mature knowledge that's brought on by experience. So in other words, short word, a uh, short phrase, experiential knowledge. Okay? Now, we're not talking about knowledge here when we talk about fun facts or trivia or scientific understanding or philosophy. When Paul says knowledge frequently in his letters, he would use it in connection with knowledge of God, knowing God. And this knowledge of God is not just knowing about God in the mind. It is an experiential knowledge, a knowledge that transforms us. Look at what he says, for example, in Colossians chapter 3. He said, do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self and its practices and have put on the new self, which is what? Being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here's what Paul is saying. The more you and I get to know God, the closer we walk with Him, the more reason you and I grow in our love for Him and our love for one another. Because love is rooted in the knowledge of God. Because if not, you know, we would not know actually how to love appropriately. So it's not just about knowing who God is. It's experiencing the love of God in our lives. Because after all, we're talk, when we talk about Christianity, we're talking about a relationship with Jesus Christ, right? And of course, a relationship has to do with relationship. Diba? A relationship has to do with encounters and understanding that love. Because in Christ, as we walk with Him, we begin to learn what it means to serve. We learn what it means to forgive others. And we learn, as we walk with Him, how to love others because we realize how much He loves us. Our Lord Jesus is the best example and the model of what true love looks like. And as we love Him, as we experience His love, we get to learn how to love as well. As we spend time in His presence, as we surrender to His Holy Spirit, as we study His Word, as we meditate on His Word, you know, He will enable us to walk in that love. Now, knowledge is one of those banks that allows the free flow of love. Now, there's another one. He says here in verse 9, my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and with all discernment. Now, that word discernment means to size things up, to cut through the hazy. It means to distinguish, to be able to make a difference. You know, to be able to discern, to be able to perceive, right? So when Paul says that love is to be bounded by knowledge and be able to discern it, one well, of the questions that we must ask is this. So what is the best way for me to show this love to this person based on what the Word of God says? Knowledge 
and discernment, they go together. Let me just give you an example, okay? We've heard of soft love and tough love, diba? And usually, we apply it to what? Parenting. Every parent knows that love is expressed in different ways, in different times to the same child. Now, some parents actually think that uh, giving their child whatever, their, whatever they want is the loving thing to do. Now, if you're a parent, you know for a fact that that would be the worst thing to do for your child. You don't just give your child whatever they want because you think that's the loving thing to do. For example, you don't, you don't allow your child to have chocolate as much as they want anytime they want simply because, you know, you, they, they're cute. I love this baby so much. You don't do that, right? It won't be good for their appetites. It won't be good for their teeth. It won't be good for their overall eating habits. Knowledge and discernment tells you that loving your child can be expressed either also in giving them chocolate or in withholding from them the chocolate. And that's tough love and soft love. And... and Parents also know this. Discipline is an expression of love. The parent who does not discipline their child does not love their child. Is that true? You know, God says in, the, in His Word, for us as His children, He says, you know what? I discipline you because I love you because you are my, you are my children. Soft love versus tough love. Both are legitimate expressions of love, but it's distinguished by context. And sometimes, we don't know which one to use, right? And you don't just use it in parenting. For example, if you have conflicts with other people, or if you want to set boundaries within a relationship, or you're handling a difficult brother or sister, you want to be able to handle that with love. You want to be able to respond in in love. So the dilemma here is now, when is it right to apply soft love and when is it right to apply tough love? Or maybe the second the question would be, how do we gain knowledge and discernment, right, in order for us to be able to, to love others and to love one another? Here's the answer. The answer is in the fact that Paul was praying for this for the Philippians. What does that mean? It means that it is God who will make it happen. It is God who will give you discernment. It is God who will give you knowledge. But how do you get that? Here's an observation. The person who walks with Christ loves like Christ. Amen? So it's not about, you know, gaining so much knowledge by your study or gaining so much discernment because, you know, you have a PhD in this or that, it's when you walk with the Lord so much that He will be the one to give you that knowledge. He will be the one to give you that discernment. Because as I've said earlier, knowledge and discernment is not about knowing facts or trivia here, right? You can Google that anytime. And the point is that we only love well and to the glory of God when our love for one another is driven by our relationship and our experience of the love of God in our lives. You get that? Let me say it again. We only love well and to the glory of God when our love for one another is driven by our experience of our love of Christ in our lives. We have to experience the love of Christ. The Bible says we love because God loved us first. See, people today, we can love for the wrong reasons, right? We can love out of moral obligation because we, we think we have to do it. And our heart isn't in it. Some people try to love because they think they're repaying a debt. Can you do that actually? Others are trying to, to put someone else in debt so that, you know, by quote-unquote loving them, they think they, the other person might reciprocate. Or we can love out of convenience. Or we can love when we think the person is deserving. But, you know, that person does not deserve my love. 
Or we can love because we think it looks good. You know, people see chummy chummy, you know, cute kayo, di ba? It's not real love. Truth saturated love is born out of a love walk with Jesus. In any expression of love for others that is not founded in a love for God is just hypocrisy. It is not real. Our love for others should be coming out from inside of us. Why? Because we have been walking with Christ. And sometimes the reason why we cannot love others is simply this. We're not walking with the Lord as we ought to be. And so the question always goes back to our walk with Christ. How are we walking with Him? You know, I'm always encouraging you in your walk with the Lord. We always tell you, take time to meditate on the Word of God, to study the Word, to have a moment in your day when you will just sit down with Him and speak with Him in prayer. And as a church, you know, that happens personally, and that also happens on, in a corporate level. We would tell you, we encourage you to join the small groups because in the small groups, you talk about these things. You talk about the Word of God. You talk about your experiences of, with Christ. We send you devotionals every day. You know how, how much time I, do, I spend to prepare those devotionals just for you to be able to be fed. And we talk about these things in the messages. We encourage you. Why? Because as as we learn more about God, I, I, my prayer is that we encounter Christ. That we get to know Him. That it's not just something here. It's something here. And from here, it comes out. It comes out as a love for God and, for love, and as a love for one another. And so Paul prays that the Philippian church will have this abounding love that is banked by what? Knowledge and discernment. Now, here's a question. What for? Why? Now, Paul will give us two reasons why. And here's the third point, no? Is that love results in right choices. You might not have thought of that, but let's look at Paul's train of thought here. In verse 9 again, it says, It is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve what is excellent. Now, that little phrase, so that, is a purpose statement, right? A purpose clause. Paul is saying, here's the reason. Here's the reason why your love needs knowledge and discernment. So that you may approve what is excellent. Now, that word approve, very interesting, is the word dokimatso. It means to put to the test, to prove, to examine. Now, in, in ancient times, that word is actually used to test metals. You know, where one takes, for instance, a coin and tries to determine how much gold or how much silver that coin has versus how much alloy or metals it has. Now, so what they would do is that they would document so that. They would examine it. They would test it. And they would approve it. So Paul is saying, we must carefully test. We must examine. We must approve the expression of our love to see what? If it is excellent. Verse 5, so that you may approve what is excellent. What does that mean? Approve what is excellent. Now, I like how the HCSB renders it. It says, so that you can determine what really matters. If you look, if you read the NIV, it says, what is best. So he's not talking here about the ability to, uh, to distinguish much from, from right or wrong, but more than the, the ability to be able to determine the best among the good. You know, we can say that so that you can be able to choose what is best. Do you see it? It's not an issue of how we feel then. It's not an issue of how much we know. It's an issue of choice, right? This kind of abounding love results in having the ability to approve things of greater value and, and importance. And conversely, it also gives us the way to disapprove of things that are of lesser significance. You see, many of the choices that the Christians make today, you know, 
are not always about the, between morally good and morally evil. Of course, we face that too, right? But most of the choices that we actually face today is between things of better value against things of lesser value. And you know, in life, we know that life is not always black and white. And the lesson is, that Paul is teaching us is this. When you and I love well, we will also choose well. When we love well, it results in choosing well. It results in us being able to make the right decisions. Do you get that? It doesn't, that doesn't sound logical, right? But here's the thing. As Christians, we all want to make the right decisions. Because let's face it, life is filled with tough decisions. Sometimes, you know, we have to have a, a variety of choices. We have a variety of options. Not just between good and evil, but between good and better, and between better and best. Right? And it's not always an easy task to decide which direction to take. You know, today our world is like this shop window where the price labels has been, you know, switched around. Uh, the, the worthless items have now be given, been given the high prices and the more, more valuable items have cheap price tags. And people have a hard time trying to find out the value of things anymore. And what we need more than anything is for us to have this sense of what is important. For us to have this sensitivity of what is of true value so that we will be able to distinguish and give our approval to those things that are excellent. So how do we get that sense of the, the important? How do we discern between the good and the best? Again, look at the flow of thought of Paul. This element of Paul's prayer grows naturally out of the first. He's telling us that you and I develop that discernment, that, make, that way of making the right choice, when we first abound more and more in our love. See, the more we love God, here's the, here's the logic of it. The more you and I love God, the closer we are to Him, the better knowledge we have of Him and His ways, the deeper our understanding of His Word, the sharper will be our discernment, isn't it? The more we love the brethren, isn't it easier for us to choose what is right now? Because we become less selfish. We become less conditional. We become more sacrificial. And when that happens, we make better choices. Here's what one writer says. He says, a fuller experience of love will lead to a finer evaluation of life. D. Martin Lloyd-Jones makes this comment. Let me read this to you. He says, the difficulty in life is to know what we ought to concentrate on. The whole art of life, I sometimes think, is the art of knowing what to leave out, what to ignore, and what to put on one side. How prone we are to dissipate our energies and to waste our time by forgetting what is vital and giving ourselves to second and third rate issues. Isn't that right? What he's saying is that sometimes we don't know or we are not able to distinguish between what's so important and what's not as important. And what happens is we spend our time on the not so important and then we leave behind what's the very things that's supposed to be very important. For example, no, it's not wrong to have a Facebook account, right? It's not wrong to, to check out how your friends are doing and, and you know, just check out your Facebook. But if you're going to spend four hours, five hours, you're know, just crawling through your Facebook, what, what does that become? It becomes a waste of time, isn't it? Same with anything else. For the young ones, video games, for even our hobbies, right? Making good choices is not always easy. Sometimes we, want able, we won't be able to distinguish the more important ones. But Paul tells us it can be done. How? When we focus on loving God and loving others based on knowledge and discernment, in doing that, everything else will actually just fall into its proper place. 
It doesn't sound so logical, but let me just tell you, it's biblical. When our love abounds, and that love is bounded by knowledge and discernment, our love will reveal, our love will reveal, will be revealed in our choices. Now, here's the fourth one. Is that love results also in the right conduct. So look at the second part of verse 10. So that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure, blameless, and blameless for the day of Christ. Now that word so, again, is another purpose word, right? Paul is actually telling us that there are two purposes of our love. Here's the reason why your growing love needs knowledge and discernment. It results in right choices and it also resort it also results in chiknamongkoy it also results in right living in right conduct now it doesn't mean that you know we live perfectly right nobody lives perfectly even paul could not do that rather the word that he means here is that you and i live with integrity okay so we make the right choices and we live rightly or we live with integrity and paul uses two words here to describe that life of integrity. He uses the word pure, and he uses the word blameless. Now, that word pure, in other translations, it's translated as um, sincere. It's the word, eli- let me just read it, el- elikrinis. Okay, I had to write the Greek word here so that I will not read it wrongly. It means unmixed, without hypocrisy. It means to be tested by sunshine. What does that mean, tested by sunshine? Now, here's what it actually, this word actually is used for before. Now, you know, in the ancient times, people would make lots of pottery. And, you know, they would sell pottery. And, and when they make the pots, they, sometimes the pots would break. There would be cracks. And so what these, these sellers would do is they would get wax to mend those cracks, to fix those cracks, so that you won't see the cracks anymore. And so sometimes when you look at the vase, you know, you won't know that there's a crack somewhere. And there was one sure way to know whether that object has been patched by wax, and it's to hold it up to the sunlight. When you do that, you would immediately see the wax. The wax would immediately be visible, and you would immediately know that that thing has a crack somewhere. Now, people at that time, when they would sell objects that have not been patched or have no cracks, they, the merchants would, uh, would advertise it with these two words. They would say, this is sine sera. It means without wax. And that word sincera is where we get the word sincere. That's why in some translations, instead of using the word pure, they use the word sincere. And so to be sincere means to be pure enough to stand the test of sunlight. That's what the word pure means. The second word is the word blameless. And that word blameless, aproskopos, means to walk without stumbling. Now, originally, that word also was used to name that part of the trap which, you know, the bait is attached. You know, a few months ago, we had this problem with rats in the house. So what my wife did was he got this, uh, she got this uh, rat trap. And there's that part of the rat trap where you put the little morsels of, you know, um, we didn't use cheese, but we, we put pork. And so we, we caught a lot of rats with that. And that little snare is the word uh, aproskopos. It's the snare which caused an animal to fall right into a trap. So to be blameless means not to be a stumbling block, not to be a snare which causes others to fall. That's what it means. It means that, you know, I don't live a double life. You know, we're putting on a good face when we come to church, and we live another way when we're out of church. It means that you and I we live with integrity, that people do not stumble over us. So these two words, pure and blameless, Paul was referring to the inward and the outward parts of our character. When it comes to ourselves, you and I are to be pure. When it comes to others, we are to be blameless. And that results from what? From our love. Again, 
Yeah, verse 11, he continues. We're almost done. And he says, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ. In other words, when you think of fruits, it doesn't happen overnight, right? When you plant a something, you don't expect it tomorrow to suddenly have fruit. Fruit grows. And it's like saying, you know, I can make my kids grow. That doesn't happen, right? I cannot make my kids grow. What I have to do is make the soil ready for planting and all of that. That's if you're, not, if you're into agriculture, you know what that means. But the idea here of fruit of righteousness that is in Christ means the picture is the life of Jesus Christ that's working in and through us that produces the fruit. So fruit becomes just a natural occurrence. You don't have to work on it. It just comes out. Paul is telling us that abounding love will result in right choices, right? And right living, integrity. And when that happens, fruit will come out and then God is glorified. Verse 11, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. So when we abound in love, which leads to right choices and leads to right living, God will be exalted in and through us. People around us will glorify the Father. Because the ultimate purpose of the Christian life is to glorify God, isn't it? And that is the goal of the prayer of Paul. I hope you see the progression. He talks about first love. Love with what? Knowledge and discernment. That love and knowledge that has to abound. Love for one another. Love for Jesus. When we do that, we will be able to make the right choices we will be able to live right. So abounding love leads to godly choices and good deeds. Now let me end with um, this little poem that I found from Poor Richard's Almanac from 1758. Here's what it says. It says, A little neglect may breed mischief. For want of a nail, the shoe was lost. For want of a shoe, the horse was lost. For want of a horse, the rider was lost. For want of a rider, the war was lost. And all for the want of a nail. You get it? He says it starts with a nail. If there was no nail, then there would be no shoe. If there was no shoe, there would be no horse. If there was no horse, there would be no rider. If there was no rider, there would be no no victory. Each was a natural progression from the other. Now, I believe, you know, this little poem uh, gives to us the same illustration that Paul proclaims in his prayer. You see, so many Christians today are trying to live the Christian life from the wrong starting point. We have to start with love. Love for God, love for the brethren. Because if there's no love, there will be have, we will have no sense of what's important. We will have no sense of what matters. And if there's no sense of what matters, there will be no reason for a life of integrity. And if there's no life of integrity, there will be no way for us to want even to glorify the Lord. It begins with love. You know, nowadays you will see so many examples of misplaced priorities, even for Christians. A genuine Christian might say, you know what, to live is Christ. And yet we can work all day long or be in school all day long with no thought of Christ at all. We can serve the church without depending on the Holy Spirit. We can pray, we can sing, but our minds and our hearts might not even be engaged. It's almost as if we, we, we're pretending to be Christians. Just going through the motions of Christianity. Since we don't want to deny the faith, even though we're not living by faith. And what happens is slowly over time, we can lose our way. We can forget what we're here and what we're here for. We can lose our priorities. So what is the priority really? When Jesus was asked, what is the greatest commandment? We can simply sum his words with his four words. He said, love God, love others. Let's not lose 
our priority. Let us be a people that is marked by love. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word today. And we realize, Lord, how, how often we do forget that you have called us to love, to love you, to love others. And we ask for your forgiveness. But we pray today that you will cause each and every one of us to grow in our love. This, that this will not just be something that we will know about, but it's something that we apply and really make the choice to do in our lives. Help us, Lord. Help us to be a people that's marked by love. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.